Good afternoon, everyone. It's a huge pleasure to be here today. Providential that we should, this select group should come together on the feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin. It was a strange journey for me. I come from Exmoor through really dense fog, very, very eerie, and driving rain and almost flooding, and I thought this was not a very good omen. But luckily, once I got across the M5, which is, I mean, it's a big physical but also psychological barrier, and I came from West Sunset into further east. They are both beautiful places, but there was a calm actually. There's a one, there's a road from Barrow Mump. Does anyone, if anyone knows Barrow Mump, which is one of the islands of of the levels in the levels, and then you go to Ossory, which also calls itself an island um, in the levels, and then of course through the great uh, town of Glastonbury with with the Isle of Avalon. Um, there did really seem to be a feeling of calm and a recognition that we are on the Michael and Mary line, not actually here in Wells, I don't believe, Tom knows more about this than me, but definitely from Barrow Mount to, to Glastonbury. So that's, that was all very, um, it was very auspicious, and it's wonderful to be here in the city of Wells, which I've been to often, giving talks on sacred gardens, actually, with Tom. And it's full of water, as it's the city of Wells. There are six wells, and the water comes from the Mendip Hills. And I think we should remember here John Michel, the great John Michel, who wrote about this area, uncovering some of its great mysteries. It's definitely a beautiful and sacred landscape. And of course, water is key to the colour green, and the colour green is some fundamental to the website, begun by Dr. Reza Shah Qasmi, who has just introduced today. And the colour green, of course, is the colour of Islam. This is no accident. When you read the Quran, you will see that the gardens of paradise are all about the colour green. And the colour green is about hope, and it's about spring, and it's really, um, there's something secretive about the colour green, because interestingly, although we see it all around us, and it's very, very lush at the moment because we've had these tremendous rainstorms and it's raining now. I feel we're embraced by the colour green here. But it, it's interesting, it is quite secretive because if you want to extract the colour green from nature, you cannot really do it directly. You have to mix blue and yellow. Um, again, Tom will know more about this and actually we have no students from Prince's School here, but they also know more. I will get on to Tom now because I'm proud to say that Tom was actually a former student of mine. Of course, he has reached sky, um, sky height since, um, since he left the school about 15 years ago, was it Tom? Um, and I, Tom is, I mean, I would say he's practically the only person I remember from writing the short essays. They all have to write an essay, our students write an essay on the meaning of sacred art. And they're quite short essays because subsequently to that they write a very long essay of about 7,000 words and I sometimes remember them. But I remember Tom's short essay because it was focused on Angkor Wat and it was a, a very beautiful essay. So we could see there that he was an exceptional student. He's gone on to be a really, really great teacher. Um, I don't want to embarrass him, but I know from my continued teaching at the school that all the students um, comment on what a good teacher he is, because he combines the practical, his knowledge and practice of geometry is almost second to none. He, of course, he has a great teacher in um, Dr. Chris Critchlow, who was also my teacher, and I would like to remember him today because he passed away, um, may, uh, may he rest in peace, earlier this year. And he would love to have been here today, and I feel his presence is here, which I'm sure Tom would agree with. So, I'll just read a little bit about Tom, because um, since he left the school, he's continued with his geometry. He teaches, he gives talks, he gives workshops, he, actually unlike almost everyone, or anyone else I know, you don't actually have a website, do you Tom? Not yet. <laughs> but he sends out very, he sends out excellent newsletters, probably only twice a year, which means that you read them, unlike others, which come sort of every week or every month. Um, importantly, he seemed to publish a book on the underlying use of geometry and cosmology within the design of the first English Gothic cathedrals, which is Wells, of course. 
Saints, and the cathedral is very nearby up the road. Um, he's also in process, and this is very exciting. And I hope we will all support him in this. Of course, we will. He's starting an educational project here in Wells, and it will be an institute, the Wells Institute for Sophia and Education. So today's talk, which is the first in a whole series of talks for this website, Tom will introduce a variety of themes that will all be expanded upon within the talks that follow this one. And so, welcome Tom, he's going to talk about greenness and the golden ratio. Thank you. In this talk, I'm going to focus upon greenness and the golden ratio. The golden ratio is a mathematical relationship that's found in the world of natural growth. And so inevitably, it goes hand in hand with greenness. We are forever surrounded by the divine presence. If only we could fully open our eyes up to this. But there are various reminders of this presence, and one of the most beautiful and invigorating of them is greenness. Greenness is an indication of light, because it becomes apparent in the world of organic growth directly as a result of its interaction with light. Light and life-giving water together bring about this greenness. If we think of greenness symbolically as a state of soul, then in Christianity, this speaks of an eternal springtime. Eternal spring is associated with the resurrected Christ. And this is related to the fact that Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. So as an equinoctial festival, it directly emphasizes that vernal quality associated with the re-emergence of light and the greenness that naturally arises from this. In Islam, green is the color of paradise. And similarly, the eternal spring in Christianity is associated with an Edenic state of soul, the soul having returned to the Garden of Eden. There's a description of eternal spring in John Milton's Paradise Lost. It gives a geocosmic description of planet Earth as being in a perpetual state of equinox, which symbolically relates both to an eternal spring of greenness, as well as also to an eternal harvest uh, at the autumn equinox. So there is no longer a seasonal cycle fluctuating between light and dark solstices of summer and winter but rather a middle path between them in a perpetual state of equinox with its springing forth of greenness as well as the perpetual autumn harvest. In many traditions, the rainbow is a symbol of a bridge that leads between heaven and earth, a mediating middle way between the worlds. Now, interestingly, the middle path of this rainbow bridge is the color green, because it is the mediating middle color of the spectrum. Red, orange, and yellow are on one side with blue, indigo, and violet on the other. But the middle path that passes between them is green. Now, in amongst all of this greenness and growth, there's a recurring mathematical relationship, which is often called the golden ratio. Numerically, it's defined as being a relationship between 1 and 1 1.618033. It goes on to an indefinite amount of decimal places and can't actually be fully defined in numbers because it's what's known as an irrational or incommensurable number. So it can't actually be expressed in rational numbers and therefore, symbolically speaking, it is ultimately beyond what the human mind has the capacity to know. But having said this, it can be seen in simple visual terms within the appearance of fivefold symmetry. So whenever you see a fivefold form, such as this flower, for instance, you're effectively looking at the golden ratio. Fivefold symmetry contains this particular arithmetic in the following way. 
Now, if we consider the distances between the tips of the petals on this flower, it can be said that if the distance from one petal tip to its neighboring petal tip is one, then the distance from one petal tip to its next door but one neighbor is 1.618. So what it can effectively say is from here to here, if that's one, then from here to here is 1.618, and that's the golden ratio. So in fivefold five symmetry, it's actually possible to see this arithmetic, but perhaps most importantly, it's beautiful. They really are the stars of the earth. Now, sometimes a flower will pretty much fully embody its five-fold geometric archetype, such as this one here, which is about as close as you can get to uh, a regular pentagon. But each five-fold flower will embody its numerical symmetry in its own particular way. So in one sense, all of these flowers are the same because they're all five-fold. But in another sense, they're all different because the external veiling by which the five-fold symmetry shows itself is different from one flower to another. Another shape that derives from the pentagon is the pentagram star. And I'll talk a little more about this star shape later on in relation to Gawain, because he's described in the poem, Gawain and the Green Knight, as having a pentagram on the front of his shield. And there's quite a detailed symbolism that the poem associates with this pentagram. Now in mathematical terms, the relationship between the pentagon and the pentagram star is one that involves the golden ratio. And this returns us to that mathematical description I gave a little earlier in relation to the five-fold flower and the distances between its petal tips. If the five petal tips coincide with the five corners of the pentagon, then it can be said that if the edge of the pentagon has a length of one, then each of the five lines that forms the pentagram star have lengths of 1.618. So if we can say, if this is one, and this is 1.618, and that's that golden ratio relationship. Now, another example of the golden ratio can be seen here in relation to in the relationship between the edge of the smaller pentagon that's at the center of the pentagram star in relation to the length of the star's stellation. So if we take this pentagon here at the center of the star, if we say that the edge of that pentagon is one, then each of the lines that forms a stellation, so this line here is 1.618. So again, we have the golden ratio in that way, one to 1.618. And we can also add another shape into this diagram, which numerically expresses a doubling of five, because the decagon is a regular 10-sided polygon. And as you can see here, its edge coincides with the edge of the smaller pentagon at the center of the pentagram star. So therefore, if the edge of the decagon is one, its radius is 1.618. Now this decagonal shape is another one that shows itself in floral form, as can be seen here in this morning glory flower. Now, rather wonderfully, this flower opens up every morning so as to receive the light of the sun, and it then closes again in the evening when the daylight fades. Here's another tenfold form, and in a certain sense, you're looking here at a self-portrait because the image shows a cross-section of a DNA spiral. Now, if you count the numbers of points on the star, you'll see that there are 10 of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this ratio is at the very heart of our physical being, as well as being found within the world of flowers and organic growth more generally. Here are some pictorial analyses of the bones in the human arm. 
Now, on the average person, the cubit measurement, which is the distance from the elbow to the tip of the outstretched fingers, uh, is cut at the golden section by the position of the wrist. So if the distance from the tips of the fingers to the wrist is one, then from the wrist to the elbow is 1.618. There are similar approximate relationships in the hand itself, as you can see here. Now, moving from right to left, you can see how the relationship of 1.618 to 1, a larger measurement to a smaller measurement, shows itself in a recurring sequence where there's a larger measurement followed by a smaller measurement to the left of it. But that smaller measurement can then be looked upon as the larger measurement of 1.618 in relation to the smaller measurement of 1 that lies to the left of it, and so on. So if we were to say that this is 1.618, then this would be 1. Whereas if this was 1.618, then this would be 1. And if this was 1.618, this would be 1. Now, a particular spiritual attribute of the golden ratio's arithmetic is that it forever orientates the soul's vision towards the one. It's forever pointing towards the one. And this occurs as a result of its particular arithmetic qualities. If the number one is multiplied by 1.618, then the result is, of course, 1.618. But if we go in the opposite direction and divide 1 by 1 1.618, the result is 0 0.618, which, as you can see, is precisely 1 less than 1 1.618. Now, if we look at these relationships on a number line, it can be demonstrated that a number line which begins from 0 0.618 and ends with 1 1.618 is cut at the golden section by the 1. Now, another way of seeing this relationship with one is like this. If 1.618 is divided by 1.618, then the result is obviously one. But if 1.618 is multiplied by 1.618, then the result is 2.618, which is, of course, 1.618 plus one. So the arithmetic of the golden ratio is forever pointing the soul towards the one. Now, if a number line from one to 2.618 then is used to express this particular relationship, the golden section falls between them at 1.618. Another geometric example of this can be seen in the golden rectangle. Now this rectangle has a short edge of one and a long edge of 1.618. If you take a square away from the golden rectangle, you're left with a golden rectangle. Now, in this case, the square is the one because that's the length of all four of its edges. So when the square is taken away, you're left with a smaller golden rectangle that has a short edge of 0.618 and a long edge of one. So as you can see, the relationship of 0.618 to one is the same as the relationship of one to 1.618 and indeed also of 1.618 to 2.618. So a golden rectangle is effectively a square added to a golden rectangle. But it's also a square taken away from a golden rectangle. And this relationship carries on in this way. And it naturally forms a spiral like this, which is sometimes called a golden spiral. Now, another way in which the golden ratio shows itself in the growth of flowers uh, is present in the golden angle. This is the golden angle as it shows itself within the circle. Now, if the 360 degrees of the circle are divided by 1.618, then the larger angle is 222.5 degrees. But the so-called golden angle is then the remaining 137.5 degrees, the smaller angle. And this can then be calculated by dividing the 360 degrees by 2.618. That's what gives the 137.5 degrees. Now, these two angles, a smaller one and a larger one, relate to each other as 1 to 1.618. 
One of the ways in which this shows itself in plant growth is shown here. If a leaf grows off a stem along a particular axis, so from that yellow bud at the center that you're looking at here, and then the axis of the next leaf will spring forth at 137.5 degrees around the stem. So if you follow the numbering here, you'll see that um, this keeps recurring as each new leaf springs forth. So you see the axis of the first leaf with number one written on it coming out of uh, the yellow bud. Then if you go clockwise, 137.5 degrees, that'll give you the axis of the leaf with number two written on it. And then another 137 and a half degrees, and that'll give you uh, the axis of the leaf with number three. And so it goes on. Now there's a very particular practical quality that this growth pattern embodies in as far as no leaf ends up growing directly above any other leaf. And so each one has access to the light. And this after all is what the leaf does. It is effectively the solar panel of the plant. Uh, the leaf's greenness is then brought about by its interaction with the light. And so greenness and the golden ratio do appear to have this very direct relationship in this particular case. Now, another very familiar example of this angle in the world of natural growth can be seen in the phyllotaxis spirals found in the seeds heads of flowers. They're all based on this, this angle, 137.5 degrees. Now, phyllotaxis literally means leaf counting. Now, as you can see, there are spiral formations of seeds issuing forth from the center of this seed head, uh, going in both directions. The spirals move both to the right and also to the left. Now, if you count the numbers of seeds in both a rightward and a leftward moving spiral from the same starting point, you'll often find that there are two different numbers that you can count, which are either consecutive Fibonacci numbers or that their relationship expresses some other kind of rational approximation of the larger and smaller parts of the golden ratio. So the very seeds of this flower's regenerative potential embody this mathematical pattern via their communal interaction within the flower's seed head. Now this potential for rebirth and greenness that lies at the heart of the flower is imbued with this knowledge of the golden ratio, a knowledge of the one which it then embodies in its beautiful form. Now, as I just mentioned, the Fibonacci numbers are found in the world of organic growth, and they approximate the larger and smaller parts of the golden ratio. The way in which this works is uh, as follows. Now, the number sequence develops in such a way that each new number is added to the number that precedes it. So if the sequence begins from the number one, there's no number before number one. So the number one needs to be written for a second time. Now, when the second number one is added to the first number one that precedes it, they together make two. And then two plus one, the number that comes before it, is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight. Eight plus five is 13. 13 plus eight is 21, and so on. Now, this number sequence is accordingly an ideal model for tradition because it looks from the present into the past and then through this relationship, there becomes an appropriate move into the future. So in other words, if we're on number eight, we look back to the number five and this relating of present and past then together brings about the future number of 13. Now this looking back into the past doesn't um, ape or copy the past. So the number eight doesn't move back and try to become like the number five, but rather learns from it and then moves forward to the number 13 because the relationship of five to eight is very similar to the relationship of eight to 13, because both approximate that lesser to greater of the golden ratio. So each successive number is new and hasn't been before, but each one can trace its way back to the origin. So in this sense, each new number is original and hasn't been seen before, but its originality is in its link back to the origin rather than just purely being because it's a new number that hasn't been seen before. Uh, if the number 12 came after the number eight, this would be a new number that had not been seen before, but its relationship to the number eight wouldn't reflect the relationship of the number eight to the number five or the number five to the number three, all the way back to the one from which the whole growth series originates. Now, the way in which these Fibonacci numbers reflect the golden ratio can be seen in the dividing of each number by the number that precedes it. 
the results of these divisions are written below the sequence of Fibonacci numbers. So if one is divided by one, the answer is inevitably one. If two is then divided by one, the answer is two. But from now on, all the answers will be between one and two. But more to the point, they will increasingly become more and more similar to the golden number of 1.618033. So three divided by two is 1.5, five divided by three is 1.666, eight divided by five is 1.6, 13 divided by eight is 1.625, 21 divided by 13 is 1.615. So there we have it to two decimal places. And this just carries on, as you can see, it just carries on. And eventually in the bottom right hand corner, you can see how uh, already at a, a relatively uh, early points in the sequence, there is 1.618033, which is the golden ratio to uh, six decimal places. Now this movement towards the golden ratio, it forever continues moving closer and closer, but in the end, Fibonacci numbers can never fully express the golden ratio itself due to it being irrational and therefore beyond any relationship that can be expressed through rational numbers. Now, the consecutive Fibonacci numbers 5, 8, 13 are particularly prevalent within the natural order. Uh, for instance, they're used as the basis of uh, the musical scale in Western music. Now, here are some examples in uh, phylotaxis. So what I'm going to do is count in on a spiral that's going one way and then stop at a certain point and then count outwards on a spiral going in the opposite direction. So if I begin from here, I'm going to go eight to five. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'll begin from here. One, two, three, four, five. Now, if the seed head is bigger, then of course you're going to get bigger numbers. So on this um, daisy, we'll count 13 and 8. So beginning from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then beginning from there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Now these numbers, these consecutive Fibonacci numbers, 5, 8, 13, they also appear cosmologically in the relative movements between the planets Earth and Venus. And Venus, of course, is the planet of love, but she is also the planet of greenness because copper and verdigris are alchemically associated with Venus, as well as also the green emerald, which is her gemstone. So here is a Venusian example of the relationship between greenness and the golden ratio. There's also the medieval Christian character, uh, Lucifer, who loses an emerald from the brow of his crown. Now, Lucifer is also symbolized by the planet Venus in the sense of rising in the east as the morning star and ascending into heaven, but also setting in the west as the evening star and falling down into the underworld. Now, the emerald that Lucifer loses from his crown symbolizes his sense of eternity, his knowing, which he loses when he falls from heaven. Now, much like the Islamic character Iblis, Lucifer is an angel who falls as a result of his pride because Lucifer's rise as the morning star in the east is a hubristic one in which he attempts to raise his ego to the level of divinity. The inevitable outcome of this is for him to then fall in the west as the evening star and to descend to the lowest point of the underworld. Now, what you're actually looking at here is a diagram of the Venus pentagram. It presents a, a geocentric viewpoint, which means that planet Earth is fixed at the center of the diagram. So you need to imagine that you're floating above planet Earth as Earth orbits the sun, so that the Earth appears to be fixed in its position. Now the curving white line then embodies the five-fold pattern, uh, and that's the way that Venus moves around planet Earth over the course of an eight-year cycle. Uh, the equivalent thing would happen if you viewed this cosmic relationship from a, a Venus-centric perspective as well, with Earth going around Venus, which is fixed at the centre. Now, the reason why this happens is because the periods of time that it takes for Venus and Earth to orbit the Sun approximates the golden ratio. Venus orbits the Sun more quickly than Earth, and so its orbital period is the smaller period of time, 
whereas Earth's orbit is the larger. So as a result of this relationship, a five-fold pattern such as this one is inevitable because the golden ratio naturally produces five-fold patterns. The same type of pattern is created if you look from a um, heliocentric, uh, sun-centered perspective as well. Uh, this, di this diagram shows the sun at the center and the two concentric circles are the orbits of Venus and Earth. Now, if you draw a line between the relative positions of Earth and Venus every few days, then uh, a spirograph type pattern begins to develop. And after eight years, it produces this pattern. So Venus truly is the rose of the heavens and therefore also the rose of divine love. In medieval Christianity, the rose of divine love came to be associated with the Virgin Mary. Now, when you see medieval Christian images of roses, uh, you're often looking at a thornless rose because the Virgin Mary is described as the rose with no thorns. Now, this is actually a symbolic description of the rose in the Garden of Eden. So in an Edenic state of greenness, the rose has no thorns. It's actually through the fall of humankind that the rose grew its thorns, because the thorns are the passions or the suffering of the earthly existence. Now, it's the wild rose or um, the dog rose with five petals that's generally the one that's depicted in uh, these medieval Christian images that you see of the rose. Um, but even on the more recent breeds of rose that have many petals, you can still see the rose's fivefold symmetry through its five sepals on the back of the rose. Uh, and this just reminds us again how the rose is the earthly fivefold image of Venus and her divine love. Now, this cosmic and floral symbolism of heaven and earth is associated with the Virgin Mary in relation to some of her titles and epithets. Um, she's both the Rosa Mystica, the mystical rose, but also the Stella Matutina, which is the morning star, which is, of course, the planet Venus. The title morning star is also associated with the resurrected Christ, and uh, I'll go into more detail in relation to this within another talk. But just to say that with Christ, the title is related to death and resurrection in the sense of the planet Venus setting in the west and descending into the underworld, followed then by rising in the east as the morning star and ascending into heaven. Now, with the rose in mind, we can look at the rosary beads, which, as the name suggests, are directly associated with this Marian and Venusian symbolism of the rose. And the rosary is specifically a form of Marian veneration. Now, as you can see clearly, the uh, rosary beads are fivefold in their form. There are five mystery beads uh, equally distributed around the circle of beads. And then in between each one of these five beads, there are the five um, decades, which are the five distinct sets of 10 beads. Now, these are, of course, all familiar numbers in relation to the golden ratio in flowers that I was um, showing you earlier. So a fivefold rose inevitably accords in geometric terms with the fivefold symmetry of the rosary beads. But perhaps the most interesting connection here is with the shape of the whole chain of rosary beads. It is essentially the same shape as the planetary glyph symbol of Venus, in the sense of it being a circle with a cross underneath. So to pray in numerical cycles of five and ten is to synchronize the soul with the equivalent numerical forms of both the heavenly and earthly images of divine love. So let's put the rosary beads back into the distance and then we can add uh, the Venus pentagram onto it so that it uh, accords with the five mystery beads. And then we can put the rose in the middle too, and we get one uh, Marian Venusian diagram. Now this brings us to the hand of Fatima. Uh, the association of the female with the number five can also be seen within the hand of Fatima. Um, it's also known as a Hamsa, the Arabic word for number five, because of the five digits upon the hand. 
Now, interestingly, the association of the Virgin Mary with the number five seems to start to develop around the 12th century and only in the Roman Catholic Church, not in the Orthodox Church. Now, at least this is when the first traces of it begin to emerge around the 12th century, uh, particularly in the words of Christians such as um, Bernard of Clairvaux, as well as within the floral springtime symbolism found in the traditions of courtly love. So it's, it's interesting to consider whether this association was in any way influenced by the ancient Middle Eastern tradition that can be seen in the hand of Fatima. Now, Jews call this, um, this talisman the hand of Miriam, uh, as in Moses' sister, Miriam, and Middle Eastern Christians call it the hand of Mariam, after the Virgin Mary. Now, the era when the Virgin Mary became associated with the number five is the very same time as when the Crusades were taking place. And there was inevitably a mixing of Western European and Middle Eastern cultures at that point in history. Now, the actual talismanic image of the hand is thought to date all the way back to Inanna, the Sumerian planet Venus. And the association that the talisman generally has relates to protection. Now, this then naturally leads to Gawain, who has a fivefold pentagram on his shield. And of course, a shield is specifically used for protection from harm. Now, Gawain's shield is red and has a golden pentagram on it, uh, rather like the inner gold that results from uh, an alchemical transmutation. But Gawain's pentagram is also very specifically associated with five significant symbolic themes, each of which is also fivefold. Now, the first one is Gawain's five senses, so his, his body. Uh, the second one is the five fingers upon his hand, and that inevitably is reminiscent of the hand of Fatima. Now, then there are the five wounds of Christ, followed by the five joys of Mary, and finally, the five virtuous chivalric characteristics, generosity, friendship, continence, self-control, courtesy, but then most importantly, piety. And Gawain's religious path is, of course, the path of love in Christian form. Now, I'd like to finish off by mentioning these three figures here, who are, in one sense, one and the same figure, albeit appearing in different ways within the three monotheistic traditions of the Middle East. They are all different versions of a very old Middle Eastern agrarian figure who's associated with death and rebirth, as understood symbolically through the greening of springtime after the deathliness of winter. Now, the name George actually means farmer in the sense of the one who works the earth. Uh, the geo of George me means earth. Now this naturally relates to the idea of the one who prepares the ground for the sowing of the seed. And this of course is an essential stage before there can be any um, ascent of greenness towards the divine light of the sun. Now the association of greenness um, is directly present with uh, Khida in Islam, whose name actually means the green one. Um, it's said that wherever he prays, greenness will spring forth from beneath him. Now, there's a very interesting calendrical connection to these themes of greenness and the golden ratio, and it involves the Middle Eastern feast day of St. George and Hida. Uh, St. George's Day is on April the 23rd in, um, uh, in Western Europe, although as a result of the relationship between the Gregorian and Julian calendars, the Feast of St. George in the Middle East and parts of Eastern Europe is actually on May the 6th. And this is also the Feast of Chida, who is known, uh, it's known as Chidarellas, which means Chida and Elijah, because it's the day when Chida and Elijah uh, meet on earth. Now, the point that's of geocosmic interest here is that May the 6th is the precise midpoint between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So it's inevitably within that particular seasonal period of increasing light uh, in which there's that great burst of greenness that presents itself with such vitality, um, particularly in the month of May. And May is, of course, also the fifth uh, month of the year, uh, as well as being the month of the Virgin Mary. If we look upon this um, eight-spoked wheel as an image of the annual cycle, uh, we can look upon the darkest, uh, lowest point of the year as being the winter solstice. 
we can then move clockwise around the circle and get to the summer solstice at the top. And this is the highest point of the year uh, in terms of light. Now, halfway between these two solstices are the equinoxes of spring and autumn. So as I just mentioned, uh, Chidereles is precisely at the midpoint between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So therefore Chidereles is effectively at the golden section of the annual cycle, or more precisely, he's at the Fibonacci division of the annual cycle. Uh, if the winter solstice is understood to be the beginning and the end of the cycle of life and greenness, then May the 6th is precisely three eighths into the cycle and five eighths before the end of the cycle. And three, five and eight are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Now, if we isolate these two points in the year, what we effectively have is the golden angle that I described earlier. It's not precisely the same. Now, in a similar way to Fibonacci numbers not being precisely the same as the golden ratio, but they do in a sense relate to the same underlying mathematical principle of the golden ratio. Now, in these two circular images, the uh, annual cycle shown on the left is obviously made up of 365 and a quarter days, whereas the circle on the right containing the golden angle can be looked upon as containing 360 degrees. So the perceived number of divisions of these two circles is slightly different. And uh, on top of this, the circle on the left is divided according to uh, the Fibonacci division 8 over 5, whereas the golden angle on the right is derived directly from the golden section. So the numbers involved in these two diagrams can't be precisely the same, but they are very similar because there are actually 137 days from the winter solstice to Fidereles, whereas the golden angle is 137.5 degrees. So the greenness of uh, Chidda's festival in early May also seasonally embodies the golden ratio within the annual cycle. But perhaps most importantly, this external greenness and its mathematical harmony is a reminder of a particular state of soul in which there has been a descent into the darkness of a wintry death, followed then by a springtime resurrection through a greening of the soul and a rising of the bright morning star in the east. So in conclusion, greenness and the golden ratio could be said to remind the soul of light, life, and the one. Now such reminders play an essential part in what could be called spiritual ecology. But the possibility of spiritual ecology requires a particular relationship with the world around us, whereby the greenness that arises in springtime is experienced as a mirror image of the greenness that forever springs within the soul.